up and go in and then you may line on Facebook. I gather you've been surviving the hurricanes, Dennis. Did we lose Dennis? Yeah, he's just muted. Charles and Dennis are muted. Okay, so we're still searching, okay. Trouble with my unmute. No, now can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, we had a little rain with the hurricane last time, came through the roof. So lifted a little bit of the, the hurricane, lifted a little bit of the tiles and allowed the water to get underneath and that kind of stuff. But considering what could have happened, no, everything was fine. A lot of tree branches and palm fronds and all that thing on the ground. So it actually made me get out and work, which uh, I don't Dennis, tend to do much down here. Dennis is unfortunate and lives in Sarasota, Florida. Well, I used to think that was really fortunate, but damn, it's been so hot. It was a very hot summer. And it, now, today was the first day we actually had the windows open to let cool air in. Here it is halfway through November. So. Anyway, I'll be looking to come back up to Virginia and uh, find a place to live in the summer. I was going to stay with you, but you're selling your house, so. Well, I was hoping you'd buy it, but you, you uh, hung back. Who's got, who's got that kind of money? Not me. Oh, well. Just Man. Poor, poor Colonel. God. But I was lucky that you uh, sold it so quickly. I guess we could start, Barbara. Yeah, so let's get to Zoom. There we go. There, all right. Welcome to this evening's program. My name is Barbara Dickinson. I'm the Executive Director of the Friends of Hanley Regional Library. I want you to welcome to an author talk this evening. The title of this evening's program is U.S. Colored Troops' Decisive Role in the Civil War. And we have the author with us here, Dr. Eugene Bennett. Um, the Friends have been around since 1977. The Friends support the library, the Hanley Library at the time, now the Hanley Regional Library System, th through raising funds sometimes, writing grants, and always providing programs free to our public. So we're very glad to continue that even in the time of virtual and Zoom and live Facebook. So we want to welcome you tonight. Um, I think we'll have the Dr. Bennett give his presentation and then afterwards there'll be time for question and answer and we'll watch the chat. So if you have something, you go ahead and enter in the chat room and we can bring that up when we're over on uh, Zoom, when the Zoom program ends. And it'll be on Facebook later. So if you have some friends that you're talking to about this program, direct them to the library's Facebook page and they can enjoy this program. Um, the library does have the book. This is from one of Dr. Bennett's book, Collective Amnesia, American Apartheid, African Americans, 400 Years in North America, 1619 to 2019. We have that book in the library, but if you also may want to buy it for yourself or as a gift, and you can get that through Dr. Bennett's website, genebennett.com. So now it's my pleasure to introduce the author. Dr. Bedett, Eugene Bedett, uh, served as a German and Russian linguist and military intelligence analyst in the US Army for 20 years. He, he studied Russian and German, I learned tonight. He and his wife had lived, now live in Lake Holiday near Winchester, Virginia, having moved here from Arlington, where they lived for over 35 years. He is currently a docent at Bell Grove Plantation. He's a volunteer with the National Park Service at Cedar Creek National Historical Partnership Park and is a librarian for the Cedar Creek Battlefield Foundation. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Bennett. Take it away. 
Well, good evening. Thank you both for joining us. Can you see? Uh, I hope you can see my PowerPoint slide. We just I cannot see your slide at the moment. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Okay, now I can see it. Excellent. Well, it's, this one's not so critical, except the, the website may be jeanbatie.com. Just to explain my, my last name, it's French Canadian. Oh. In my 20 years in the Army, I heard at least 12 varieties of pronunciation. I never cared much <clears throat> as long as I got my paycheck. Didn't matter. I got a lot of interesting variants. So, so this talk is based on Chapter 3, one of 12 chapters of my book, Collective Amnesia, American Apartheid. And I won't read the whole rest. It's a very long title. My next book is <laughs> much shorter. Anyway, and it's 502 pages, topics rarely mentioned in standard US histories are addressed. And just as a pitch, I'm selling the hard cop, hardbound edition for $10 plus postage on my website, jeanbatie.com. You'd have to pay $35 for that book on Amazon. This <clears throat> chart slide, gives you some a scan of the topics addressed in the 12 chapters. And a good note is, is even though it's 502 pages and a lot of data, each one of those chapters stands alone. So they're much, pretty much like a magazine article. You can read one at a time as the topic uh, strikes you. I think the first appendix, the conclusions of a group of experts of the United Nations Working Group on people of African descent after they visited the United States in January 2016 is worth the price of the book alone. It's very interesting seeing what a group of foreigners think of us. We're not quite as perfect as we'd like to think. <clears throat> the US colored troops played a decisive, decisive role in bringing the Civil War to an end. One of the most significant discoveries I made during the more than four years of research was a tremendous impact and essential contribution the large scale recruitment of freemen and former slaves had on the Civil War's outcome. It is no ex exaggeration to say that without their contribution, the war would have dragged on several more years and it might have had a far different outcome. US colored troops were as decisive as Grant's leadership <clears throat> in bringing the war to an end in the spring of 1865. Lincoln's executive order, the Emancipation Proclamation issued on January 1st, 1863, was meant to deny the Confederacy support from Great Britain and France and to deprive the South of the considerable advantage their nearly 4 million slaves were adding to their war effort. But the proclamation also contained a less known and far reaching provision authorizing the recruitment and training of black troops. And now these days we might think that is no big deal, but you would have to understand how you could have cut the racism back then. I mean, just trust me when I say it was unbelievable. Even many union troops in the US in the Union Army were very unhappy with this decision that Blacks were going to be wearing blue uniforms. Anyway, the wording was, and I further declare and make known <clears throat> that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the United States to garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places, and to man vessels of all sorts of said service. The implications of this sentence were as far reaching as the abolition of slavery itself. U.S. colored troops and black sailors' contributions to the war effort decisively tipped the Civil War in favor of the Union. Although due to the prejudices of white supremacy and racism, their major contribution was completely erased from public consciousness within a few decades. How many of us had a clue that a single African-American was engaged in the Civil War, let alone thousands, before we saw Morgan Freeman, Denzel Washington, in glory made in 1990. There was a precedent <clears throat> for black service in the armed forces. 
Despite Washington's initial opposition, about one seventh of the Continental Army was comprised of slaves and freemen due to the reluctance of whites to enlist. Washington's aide, Colonel Alexander Hamilton, probably helped change Washington's attitude when he said, the contempt we have been taught to entertain for blacks makes us fancy many things founded neither in reason nor experience. Their natural faculties are probably as good as ours. And two black battalions fought with distinction under Andrew Jackson at New Orleans during the War of 1812. But no black troops served during our war with Mexico because South Carolina slavery advocate John C. Calhoun banned African-American service while he was Secretary of War. Lincoln's decision to accept black men in the Union Army was radical given the prejudice of his time. Indeed, even he originally had misgivings about the recruitment of colored troops, fearing that if blacks were armed, their weapons would fall into the hands of the Confederate Army. But one of Lincoln's great strengths was his openness. And months later, <clears throat> his opinion evolved to authorize the enlistment of blacks. Recruitment began in March, 1863. By war's end, slightly two years later, the United States <clears throat> colored troops comprised roughly 200,000 men organized into 175 regiments of infantry, cavalry, artillery, and engineers. This was about 10% of the federal army under arms and represented a larger force than the Confederacy had in the field on all fronts during the last two years of the war. That's kind of a mind boggling fact, but it's true. U.S. colored troop total was also larger than the Army of the Potomac or of the forces Sherman commanded in the Western theater of operations. Significantly, U.S. colored troops were recruited and trained when nearly all other sources of manpower were exhausted on both sides. Confederates resorted to the draft in April 1862, and when North followed suit in mid-1863, major draft riots erupted in many Northern cities, including a four-day outbreak in New York City, suppressed by four combat regiments fresh from Gettysburg. Clearly, the North's addition of a force this size in the last two years of the war significantly impacted the outcome. No less critical were the roughly 20,000 sailors serving in the Union Navy. Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells authorized black services early as September 1861. Blacks had traditionally served aboard ships. Historian James McPherson gives the peak strength of the Federal Navy is 51,500, which means that blacks constituted more than one third of the Navy's strength, enabling the Union to maintain its strong blockade. They served in integrated crews, but only at the lowest rank, no possibility of promotion. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton dispatched the Army's Adjutant General, Lorenzo Thomas, to the Mississippi Valley in March 1863 with the mission of recruiting Black soldiers. He was supported from the first by the theater commander, General Ulysses S. Grant, who recognized the potential of Black troops. Working closely with Grant, Thomas took to his assignment if it were, as if it were a religious calling and made a vital contribution to the war effort. Through Thomas's efforts, 14 U.S. Colored Troop regiments were trained and another 24 were in the process of formation only five months later. By the word's end, the old soldier had a hand in organizing 20 regiments, 70 regiments, excuse me, placing over 76,000 Black troops under arms or more than 40% of Colored Troops a truly monumental feat. In this, he was fully supported by Grant, who told him, I'm anxious to get as many of these Negro regiments as possible to have them full and completely equipped. The huge windfall of Confederate weaponry ca captured at Vicksburg on July 4th, 1863, helped make this possible. Ironically, many colored troops were armed with captured Soviet, excuse me, Soviet, <laughs> Southern weaponry. Ha! Boy, talk about a slip from my past. Dennis is laughing right now. Pay was an immense source of dissatisfaction because of Congress. White privates earned $10 a month plus a $3 closing allowance, but all black soldiers, regardless of rank, including chaplains and surgeons, 
who received $100 monthly in white regiments received $10 from which $3 was deducted for clothing. This meant that black soldiers received less pay than black laborers who were not subjected to the rigors of march and combat. Amazingly, this had minimal effect on morale, even though this injustice was not rectified until the war was nearly over. Certainly did have some individual reactions. Uh, at least one sergeant, black sergeant was executed for protesting too much, but otherwise they were super soldiers. At first, the North expected little from black troops, reflected in the declaration that they would serve at the garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places. But as the North conquered more Confederate territory, there was need for troops to defend lines of communication from raiders like John Singleton Mosby, John Hunt Morgan, and Nathan Bedford Forrest. As the enlistment terms of many white regiments, which had fought since the war began, began to expire, they were released, creating a greater urgency to use black troops in combat roles. The first major engagement of black troops occurred during the siege of Port Hudson, when two Louisiana Native Guard regiments joined other Union forces in assaulted, assaulting this heavily defended strong point. Both regiments attacked with such vigor that prejudiced minds began to change. A white lieutenant who had doubted Black's valor declared he no longer had any reservations. Another white officer explained that Blacks were, quote, far superior in discipline and just as brave as whites. A Massachusetts soldier remarked, a nation of serfs stepped up to the respect of the world and commanded and commenced a national existence. 10 days after Port Hudson fell, a Union supply base at Milliken's Bend, garrisoned by about a thousand men, including four understrength, partially trained black companies, was attacked by around 1,500 Confederates. Despite the defenders' antiquated muskets and limited fire support, the Confederates were forced to withdraw. A Southern diarist wrote in her journal, it's hard to believe that Southern soldiers, Texans at that, had been whipped by a Mongol crew of black and white Yankees. But both engagements took place in the Western theater, far from the war's focus. The battle that cemented the blacks' reputation as fierce fighters took place in July 1863 at Fort Wagner, which protected Charleston, South Carolina. The 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment's assault, although repulsed with the loss of almost half the regiment's strength, and the death of its gallant commander, Robert Gould Shaw, inspired national intention, memorialized in the movie Glory, just about the only contemporary appreciation of the tremendous role African-Americans played during the four long bitter and bloody years of war. The South responded vehemently to the North's initiative aimed at turning their greatest asset against them. On May 1st, 1863, the Congress of the Confederate States of America issued a joint resolution which stipulated that white officers commanding black units who were captured in battle were to be executed and black soldiers were to be re-enslaved. The resolution was not followed consistently despite Southern racial animosity and fears of servile insurrection. Moreover, it had a boomerang effect causing US colored troop units to fight more resolutely knowing that slavery or death was a likely consequence of su surrender. By war's end, U.S. colored troops had participated in 449 engagements, including 39 major battles. Blacks guarded thousands of railroad bridges, supply depots, and other installations vital to the Union war effort. 33 black regiments, approximately one eighth of Grant's army, actually uh, <laughs> Meade's army, participated in the eight month stage of Petersburg, compelling Lee's Army of Northern Virginia to surrender. Grant himself had ordered their transfer east. In the West, Sherman preferred to use black troops in the rear guarding depots and bridges, but some of his black regiments participated in combat action, notably the 14th US Colored Infantry, which decisively halted Joe Wheeler's cavalry at Dalton, Georgia, and defeated Nathan Bedford Forrest troopers at Pulaski, Tennessee. And in the last major combat action of the war at Fort Blakely outside of Mobile, Alabama, 
black troops led the way. 19 African-American soldiers were awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Seven black sailors received that honor for gallantry and 13 white officers commanding black troops also received the award. Now I want to address an interesting subset of the freemen and former slaves locally recruited into Mr. Freeman's army. That's not so clear, I guess, recruited here in Winchester. Thanks to the efforts of Sheila Gaither Elliott, Hanley's archives contain documentation on 165 blacks born in Winchester who served in the US colored troops, as well as 23 more who served in the US Navy. In addition to the company and regiment in which the soldier served, the data available provides age, occupation, date and place of enlistment, and the date and place each individual mustered out. Their age of enlistment ranged from 16 well into the 40s. Military records reflect that of these 167 troops from Winchester, only four received bounty money, four were drafted, and four were hired as substitutes. Records also note that only nine deserted, a dramatically lower percentage than for white troops. The records indicate that slaves and freemen born in Winchester served in 49 discrete US colored troop units. By far the greatest number, 55, enlisted from Pennsylvania, 11 each enlisted from Virginia and Maryland, and 10 enlisted in Massachusetts to serve the 54th and 55th Massachusetts Colored Infantry and the 5th Massachusetts Colored Cavalry Regiments. Winchester-born soldiers enlisted in a total uh, from him yeah, in a total of 16 states, including New Hampshire, New York, Rhode Island, Florida, South Carolina, Louisiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, Arkansas, Illinois, Ohio, Missouri, Mississippi, and the District of Columbia. This wide geographical dispersion reflects slave owners' practice of selling off members of slave owners, slave families at will. After emancipation and the war's end, many African-Americans search for long missing family members for 50 years or more. The records also show that 10 of Winchester's soldiers paid the ultimate price. Five died as a result of wounds received in battle and five died of disease as reflected in this chart. Two US colored troops are buried in Winchester's Oryx Cemetery on Braddock Street. The photo depicts the tombstone of Richard Festus of the 16th US Colored Heavy Artillery Regiment. Two more are buried <clears throat> in Winchester National Cemetery, including Philip Lewis Brent of the 4th US Colored Infantry. Local African-Americans were not limited to service in the US colored troops because he had a pass permitting him to sell vegetables in, in Winchester. Thomas Law, a slave owned by a prominent Winchester attorney, Richard Byrd, who lived in Berryville in Clark County, was able to pass critical information from Rebecca Wright, a Quaker school teacher living in Winchester to General Philip Grant, Phil, Philip Sheridan. When Wright <clears throat> informed Law, and he passed the information to Sheridan, to Sheridan, that Jubal Early's forces had been reduced by an infantry division in one artillery battalion, Laws carried the information compressed in a small pellet wrapped in tinfoil in the side of his mouth to Sheridan, who sprang into action, resulting in twin significant victories at Third Winchester and Fisher's Hill. Those of us who were local know there were three battles of Winchester and the third was the only one that the Union came out on top. And it was due to these two folks, but Thomas Law's brave participation because he would have been shot as a spy. Rebecca Wright was rewarded for her action after war with a position in the Department of the Treasury. Thomas Laws was offered a position in Washington for his bravery but he chose, chose to continue farming in the valley and is buried, was buried by his son in the Milton Valley Cemetery in Berryville's Josephine City. The valor of black troops was recognized at the highest levels. After the first year, 
U.S. colored troops had served in the field, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton declared, many people believed or pretended to believe and confidently asserted that freed slaves would not make good soldiers, that they would look, lack courage and could not be subjected to military discipline. Facts have shown how groundless were those apprehensions. Lincoln also valued U.S. colored troops' contribution to the Union war effort, recognizing shortly before his death that black troops were stationed from Richmond to the mouth of the Rio Grande. He said, we cannot spare the 140 or 50,000 now serving as soldiers, seamen, and laborers. This is not a question of sentiment or taste, but one of the physical force. Keep it and you can save the Union. Throw it away and your Union goes with it. Unfortunately, Lincoln's assassination five days after Appomattox uh, resulted in much changed situation. But one of the best black regiments was ordered to march to Richmond to participate in the funeral. In fact, they marched at the head of the column. The regiment selected the veteran of the Petersburg trenches and which had been among the first federal units to enter Richmond, Richmond marched proudly at the head of the recession. But black troops record began to be erased when the two day grand review was held five days later in Washington DC on May 23rd and 24th. The first day, the Army of the Potomac was reviewed by General Grant and President Andrew Johnson. Although black troops were a significant part of Meade's army, none marched past the reviewing stand. The following day, when Sherman's rangy troops who marched across Georgia and North and South Carolina paraded, a battalion of black engineer troops marched at the head of each brigade of one single corps, carrying shovel and ax, wearing their ragged and torn plantation garments. Not one single black soldier marched along Pennsylvania Avenue wearing a blue uni Yankee uniform either day. Both armies had substantial numbers of US colored troops assigned. So it is telling that black soldiers were not among those triumphant ranks. This almost certainly reflects the strong, very strong racial bias of Lincoln's successor, war Democrat, Andrew Johnson. Black soldiers achieved much during the Civil War despite great odds. U.S. colored troops sub subdued in large part their severest enemy, white prejudice, by their discipline in camp, on the march, and in battle. I think Colonel Norman Hollowell, who had commanded the 55th Massachusetts Colored Infantry, provided the best summation at a reunion in 1892. We called upon them in the time of our trial when volunteering had ceased, when the draft was a partial failure, a bounty system of senseless extravagance. They were not eligible for promotion. They were not to be treated as prisoners of war. Nothing was definite except they could be shot and hanged as soldiers. Fortunate indeed it is for us as well as for them that they were equal to the crisis and the grand historic moment which comes to a race only once in many centuries came to them and they recognized it. Black troops, coupled with Lieutenant General U.S. Grant's strategic visit, vision were major factors in bringing the Civil War to a conclusion. The performance of U.S. colored troops influenced the subsequent passage of the 14th Amendment in 1868, which stipulated that all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens whose rights may not be abridged by any state. The 15th Amendment passed in 18. 70, guaranteed the right to vote regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. There was another effect too. In 1866, Congress authorized six black regular army regiments, later reduced due to budgetary <laughs> constraints to four. And those four regiments were later called the Buffalo Soldiers. They were 20% of the army that won the West. However, history is not written in stone. Black troops contributions were forgotten by a nation whose gratitude was transitory because old time attitudes of white supremacy and bigotry were far stronger. And the South refused to acknowledge that their former slaves had rights 
which could not be violated. <clears throat> the spirit of national reconciliation between the North and the South in the late 19th and early 20th centuries created an amnesia so pervasive that a popular 1928 biography of U.S. Grant observed, American Negroes are the only people in the history of the world that ever became free without any effort on their part. Thanks for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. That's all, y'all. I'm, I'm very, very glad to have been here. My name is Charles Jamison. I'm uh, president of the Culpeper Minutemen Sons of the American Revolution. Uh, and really, uh, until I was inducted into the uh, Culpeper Minutemen, I hadn't heard a lot of these stories. I was really surprised on uh, hearing what African Americans had done, even at the, the Great Battle of Great Bridge, Billy Floor. And also, uh, I. Uh, graduated from a surrogated high school. So we have a museum. We have also uh, did an exhibit on uh, Af African Americans from this area, from Culpeper, Mad I went to four counties, Culpeper, Madison, Orange, and Rappahannock counties, and did an exhibit on uh, those, those persons from this area who had fought for the North. And, but it's, it's very interesting to know this history and, and that other people are interested in finding out this stuff. I've read several books, and uh, it's, a, it's sort of a sad story when you read some of them that uh, that the African American was they were fighting for freedoms that they were in hopes of one day receiving. A lot of times. Yeah, and this was not a one-time thing. They no. uh, fought in the Spanish-American War. They fought in the First World War. They fought in the Second World War, in segregated units, and they distinguished yeah. themselves, and they got many accolades at the time, and within, let's say, two years, it's like it never happened. Not only that, after yeah. the First and Second World Wars, a goodly number of them who had the <laughs> poor judgment, I guess, to wear their uniform back in their hometown were lynched for that very reason. After the Second I World War, imagine. a sergeant was punched by a sheriff who stuck his billy club in the guy's eye. He blinded the sergeant for life just because he, he had just been discharged. was coming home very proudly in his uniform. I mean, it's amazing. We'll have to get in contact, Charles. Yeah, that would be good. That would be good. Uh, like I said, I, I, I was up in Winchester uh, this past weekend to a, uh, uh, well, a flag the retirement ceremony in Middletown. But also in the library, I guess I have a, a friend who's in the SAR from that area, Becky Ebert, that is in the Oh, yeah, I know Becky. Yep. Yeah. She helped yeah. me out, out a lot. Okay, yeah, I just know her through Brett, yeah, through a friend. But I know she's, she's in the archives and she's uh, heavily involved. That's where I got the information on, on the 167 blacks who enlisted from the Winchester area. Okay. I was kind of surprised that there were that many. Yeah. Statistics are pretty interesting, especially their geographical dispersion. How did you go about finding those Winchester soldiers? What's your research? I, I talked to Becky and talk to she Becky. told me. I mean, were they, were they on muster it, rolls? It, it, were they on muster rolls? Were they? Well, let's see. <laughs> I got a Sheila Gaither Elliott, who I, I never met the lady, but she did all the research. She downloaded their service records, which were all in a file. And all I had to do was copy them, compile, doing the thing I like best, you know, make, <laughs> make, a, make a chart. <laughs> compile, I was a bean counter in the army. I mean, order of battle officer and analyst. Like Dennis, we, we were many places together in the army. Do you happen to know anything about the Freedmen's Bureau? Was there a Freedmen's Bureau in Winchester after the war? Yes, there was, yes, there was. <clears throat> Freedmen's Bureau didn't last all that long because well, it's no surprise. <laughs> Southerners were no, not thrilled 
having lost their slaves because it's like losing your, your a fleet of Cadillacs. Slaves were not cheap. And that was their wealth, you know? I mean, it, suddenly it was gone. And suddenly the radicals, which is an interesting name because they were their only radicality was thinking that, well, these guys are free, they're human beings, so we have to treat them like that. That was, a, that was radical. I mean, <laughs> but there are many terms like scalawag and carpetbagger that Southerners slapped on these folks that stick to this day. I mean, they give a certain spin. Anyway, it, it's very, I highly re recommend the investment of $10 in my book. It's oh, I'm sure you do. <laughs> oh, yeah, I do. Why don't you buy them for gifts? Does Sean have one? That's my godson, his son. Uh oh, here it comes. <laughs> yeah, he's got oh, it. Right there. Yeah. Oh, I think yeah. I made you buy that one. I gave you a free copy of War's Cost, my other first book. Thank you. Okay, question for you. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. Well, no, I mean, uh, since you focus, I mean, your book is about 400 years of the experience of African American or Blacks in, in the country. But your presentation here is on the Civil War. So I focused differently when I was listening to you. And right in the beginning, you said that the your Black soldiers performed a decisive role in the war, in the outcome of the war. I think that's your... Yeah, that's my thesis. That's the same thing as saying, without the colored troops, the Union would not have won the war? No, I wouldn't go that far. But it what's, the word what's the word decisive mean? Because it would have lasted much longer. They, oh, it wasn't decisive. But, were, but all I'm, I'm, was. Here, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not picking over words. But if that's your lead and you say decisive, that means it's decisive. They wouldn't have won the war without the Blacks. But if you... Well, that's your interpretation, well, not mine. Well, Colonel. that's interpretation of the word decisive. But if you can prove that, if you can, I mean, if you, if you set up a good argument for that, and you do, I mean, in my mind, you have all the parts of a good argument for that, if you wanted to carry it to that, you would, you would hold a piece of ground in the Civil War historian group that is very, that would only be occupied by you and maybe a small number of other people. But that would focus a lot of attention on your book as a whole and on this contention about, about the Civil War. And uh, I think it would propel you and your book uh, into a mainstream discussion about that. I mean, just as an aside, somebody wrote a piece uh, three years back or something, I forget the person's name, and you all were the result of it, said that the uh, Blacks were extremely important to building the White House and other buildings in the Washington, D.C. area. That morphed into Blacks built the White House in, the, in, the, uh, in D.C. as well as other government buildings. And that morphed into the, uh, or resulted in the uh, carrying of that story or that fact by the uh, by Mrs. Obama in discussing it with the author. I forget what the author's name was at the moment. But I mean, you have all the articles, whether it's true or not, I don't know. But you have all the parts of the argument to make a good case that is true just in the fact of the numbers. If you say a third of the sailors were, were, uh, were African-Americans or Blacks, ex-slaves, ex -slave, whatever term they're gonna use, it's hard to believe that all the naval battles could have been conducted to success without a third of those people. Yeah. Now, my, you say- my, uh, my, you say yeah, in the ground troops in that they're 20% or 25%, that's a significant number. But if they're not combat soldiers, then they're not decisive. Do they contribute if they're guarding bridges and roads in the back? Yeah, sure. But they're not decisive. 
But I would think about that. I would think about taking your 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 data and all that and kind of rearranging it and maybe emphasizing difference here and there and try and make that argument. That they oh, I can, I can, Dennis. Black soldiers, you couldn't have won the Civil War. Well, I, I, could I say something? Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm more into the Revolutionary War. Now. And I would almost say that the same thing for the Revolutionary War and that the African-Americans, that's when they were known as the manpower pool. They were needed. They could be pulled out. If not needed, they could be shuffled to the side, but they were the manpower pool. And believe me, just like the Salem poor, there were more free African Americans than you realize. The DAR has done research at 9,000 African, about 9,000 African Americans that fought in the Revolutionary War. I went through and pulled out of the state of Virginia about 16 African Americans from this, from the Culpeper area, uh, through pension files. A lot of them through pension files and and information like that. But uh, it, it's just really sad that. Like, like my, my statement was that the African-American, they were fighting for freedom, just like at the beginning. They didn't care who it was with. They just wanted to be free. And it carried on. Uh, you know, they were fighting for freedoms that they were hoping to attain one day. It's sort of strange. Uh, when I hear about some of them, I really think that they were, they evidently were nuts. I said, why were they doing what they did? But they were fighting for freedom. Well, actually, 20,000. With that attitude about, you know, why do they do it? I would think, uh, I mean, it goes down, and Gene, you know, talks about it in his book. It goes down after every war that, you know, it's the old English thing, Tommy this and Tommy that, uh, in time of war needed, et cetera. But afterwards, nobody needs it. And the same thing, of course, in the worst condition happened to Blacks in America after every war. But uh, you might make a good case. I mean, Gino uses a number of one seventh of the of the uh, revolutionary uh, forces of black, right? You use that. One use fifth. that We're here. And I don't know if that's you know throughout the whole war, or if that's in at one time in the war, or whether that's or not a problem. general that's area a of the war. But that's an important number. This is this is term. when they were needed, they were used, and when they weren't needed, they weren't used. But when you use the term they, when they were needed, the implication is if they were needed and they were called upon, but yet they didn't show up or we didn't have them, then we would have suffered losses. So if that's the argument you're making, you should be like Gene and make a. a I must say one thing about the Revolutionary War. A lot of patriots served, they signed up for six months to a year. If an African American went in, most of the time they were in for three to five years or whatever. They were in there till it was over, or they they couldn't go any longer because they were fighting for freedoms. And it was it was uh, different with them than than what I've read on all of the records. And even from Culpeper, a lot of them served three to five years. My ancestor, I had one ancestor to serve the whole time. I had one ancestor that served with the Minutemen, and he went back for another year with Nathaniel Green later on. But uh, some of them didn't have that option. Yeah, if I could get back to Dennis's question about decisiveness. They were decisive in the sense that when they were authorized in January 1863, both sides had annihilated each other's units so efficiently that there were few sources of replacements left. As I mentioned, the Confederates resorted to the draft in 1862, March 1862, and when the Yankees did it <clears throat> in the July of 1863, June maybe, there were riots in many cities, and there was a four-day riot, greatest insurrection in America after the Civil War in New York City. It took four combat regiments to put it down. So it was a big deal that they got 200,000, as I pointed out. It was more soldiers than the South had in the field at the time. It was more soldiers than Meade had in <clears throat> the Army of the Potomac. It was more soldiers than Sherman had in, under his command in the West. 
that's include is 40,000 and march through <clears throat> Georgia and, and the Carolinas and the rest that were back at Nashville, et cetera, under Thomas. That is decisive. No, they it's didn't... not decisive unless it has a decisive effect. I mean, it's an interesting number and there are a lot of soldiers and that's very impressive. But, but I like your argument. I don't understand why you're resisting me. I, I well, like the argument that you say they're decisive. And if that means that, because in interpretation, when you say they were decisive to the outcome of the war, I think that's what your, well, that's what your slide says. That to me says without them, the union could not have won the war. And I'm just saying, if you believe said, that, when they did, it would have for that. Set, set, a whole new, set a whole new book or a whole new page oh, that book. says that. And you will, yeah, but you can hold a book on the 500 years. But, say, but focus it on that, just like I told you about the building, the, the things in uh, DC. You will carve out a hilltop, which will bring you a lot of attention, both positive and negative. But, if you, but you have the numbers. You've done this tremendous amount of research. You have the numbers. And if you persuasively order them, then, I mean, that's a good argument. You're making it, you're making it backward, but... Or you're making it, but you're not forcefully making when you say they're decisive. They're going to be mumble, you can mumble around the word what decisive means. But when you say a statement, without colored troops, the Union would not have won the war, that's pretty damn straightforward. And that is going to draw a lot of attention. But you have, in my mind, you have the, 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 uh, the numbers that might back up that argument. Well, here's a follow on argument that I make in my second book. <clears throat> they were so critical that they forced the Confederacy to resort to arming black soldiers. Unfortunately for the Confederacy, they resisted so much because arming blacks, whether freemen or slaves, was utterly antithetical to the reason that the Confederacy existed. That's right. So, they they, they, they argued they, they, back and forth. Yeah, nobody can argue that. If the Confed when the Confederates did that, what the Confederates said was, or when they wanted to do that, what the Confederates said is that we believe these people in the old German word untermenschen, untermenschen are not really people. But if now our existence depends on them doing what we couldn't do, which is what they're what they're saying when they re-enlist them, well, yeah, that destroys the whole argument for why the South was there. I have a great I'm not quote. Arguing, Gino, I'm not arguing against I know, you. I'm I know. telling you, you've got a good argument. Nobody, nobody, can, nobody, nobody can February. deny the fact that nobody can, I'm going to put you on mute. That's what's nice about not being with you. I can put you on mute and things change. No, I, I don't but, like that. <laughs> but uh, I have a great quote for you. No, I don't want to hurt. Then, well, uh, the recruiting officer, the recruiting officer in Richmond, yes, in March 1863, said the only People we can recruit now are our wives and daughters. No crap, you said that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, let's face it: the the the, the Confederacy was in dire straits. I mean, obviously, they lost a war. If they didn't surrender, they would have been annihilated. I mean, there's nobody nobody doubts that. And if it didn't happen that year, it would happen five years later. I mean, there's no way you can outdo the manpower of the North or the industrial power of the North or the munitions of the North. And when the Europe wouldn't come to their aid, you know, then the Confederate aid, there was no way they're gonna, they're gonna win this war. But yeah, all I'm saying is that your, argument, their either, valor. Your, your first slide in this presentation, either take out the word decisive or make it more clear and say, without colored troops, Union would not have won the war. And then back it up. You have you, I mean, you can make the argument, even if it's not true, and, but if you make the argument, it would be true. Even if people argue against you, it brings up everything you want to talk about and it makes it more important than what you want to talk about. Oh yeah, this is this guy, he's got a lot of numbers, blah, blah, blah. But when you draw it down and say, without colored troops, the North would not have won the war, certainly not in 1965 or ever because you know, they were getting ready to get rid of Lincoln and there was going to be some kind of an agreement, blah, blah, blah. But so, I mean, you make a, you make a good argument, you could make a persuasive argument, lead with that. I'll work on it, we'll work on it in February. Well, okay, 
you may be working on it in February, but hey, yeah, it's all right. No, I think I, 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 I well, love you're not going to see me this. I February? love the presentation. I love the presentation. No, but the and 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 Charles and Charles and Charlie. I mean, I didn't know there was so much data on on black troops in the revolution in the Revolutionary War. I just did not know that. And I'm not a guy. I'm not a guy that's that's read a lot of history. But I did not know I, any of that. Believe me, when I was inducted, it was at Great Bridge, and I heard about this guy Billy Floor, and he really was a hero at Great Bridge. Then I started looking into some. I had uh, at meetings we had other talks. Uh, just like Chief Justice, I, I live here in Culpeper, Virginia, talking about Chief Justice John Marshall, which I knew some marshals here in Culpeper. They come telling me about uh, different stories that these and uh, different, you know, children of uh, the Chief Justice. But they were wealthy here, stories I didn't know. And then I started getting some books. And at first, it really was. I got a, uh, the first book I got was by uh, Nell. And he was the first black historian, they said, because he said they had no one else to tell their story. The African-American had no one else to tell their story. And his, his drafts were kind of rough. But then I read several more, and really, uh, I was surprised. What was the gentleman's name? Uh, William, William Cooper Nell was the author. Oh, yeah, I know it. Yeah. I he was that. like the first. And then... Uh, well, I'm trying to think of the guy who was a professor at Morgan State, and then, but I read several more uh, from white authors. Uh, I'm trying to think of the, uh, oh boy, the, he was a, uh, had, had done several, uh, oh boy. Well, he had spoke several times at Harvard, and they had made a book out of his uh, talks. And one of the things that, that uh, he talked about was that even our founding fathers, they didn't have the moral courage to do what they knew was right. They fought against these things just because of someone's the color of their skin. And Dennis, they were from all of the states. Rhode Island had African Americans. It was oh, yeah. not a southern. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Rhode oh, Island yeah. was a big time yeah. purveyor of slaves. They imported them more, I think, well, only Savannah was a, a competitor. Well, well they could serve. The rest, cause that's because of Newport. Newport up there had the yeah. shipping. And they and the brown, brown and family. That's, that's why all the ships that came down came out of New York and Connecticut. And, and they, they, they survived, the they got station. their freedom. And if they didn't, their owner got the value of their, they were, their value was on part of their service, re or service record. So the Revolutionary War is interesting. To, and the same with Native Americans. Yep. They had, yep. They served at the time. They yeah, served they did. We, we every war. Yep. But but it is. Go ahead. Go ahead. Charles, is there a, one particular besides William Cooper Nell? Is there a, a book on Black African American service in the, in the Revolutionary War that you uh, would recommend? Yes. Hold on. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's how I have to operate these days too. I, I have a yes, I have a box downstairs. But this is one, uh, the Black Presence in the Era of the American Revolution. And this was, uh, let's see. Oh, by uh, Sidney Kaplan. But I, I, look, you have my email address. I have many more that there's, uh, also, I'm trying to think of the, this professor who was after Nell. He got a grant at Morgan State, and he did a book also. And one thing I liked about, about him, they did a lot. Half of the pages were research notes showing where they had gotten the stuff, you know. Yeah, that's, that's what my book does. Okay. I don't and think then, I have your email. Okay. Uh, CCJ, 1947 at gmail.com. And I have uh, some Patriots, well, pa Patriots from the American Revolution, it's about that thick. It's, it's like I said, the D well, I, ha I have about 5,000 and some names, but the DAR, and some of them may be Brutus owned by so-and-so, not even, you know, yeah. Yeah. a lot of them were like that. 
but a lot, but I was surprised at how many that were free and a lot of mulattoes on the pension files. They would be yellow, mixed race, Indian. And I was surprised at that. I wonder how their race got mixed. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's another thing we don't talk about too much. Right, right. No, no. Well, well I tell people, uh, just like, uh, I know of have read stories of families like that, and the slave owner or whatever would give the child 50 acres of land or something like that. And I've always said if a person had a heart in his body, it would be, you know, for that child to be there with you would be one thing. But for you to say, I'm going to send him over here and let somebody else whip on him, you know, I, that would be kind of hard. You mean if it was his own child? Yes, yes. Even yes. though the child was living as a slave. Yes. Yeah. To me, no, what, I mean, you what, know. what amazed me was what you said was not that they were, you know, blacks were in, in the Revolutionary War, but your your number, a seventh of the, uh, I mean, that's that's a significant number of, just like Gino's when he talked about the Navy. I yeah. Mean, those are significant numbers. Yeah. Well, I tell you, they, I go that with a lot of them, they, call, they go as many as the fifth. It's a book called The Forgotten Fifth. And I think that's the one that was by the, uh, oh boy, I've got a, got a box of books downstairs right now. But, uh, no, but I know it. one was The Forgotten Fifth. I can Google it. Yeah. yeah. Well, about 20,000 blacks fought for the British during the yeah, Revolutionary yeah, War. Yeah. And that's because you know, they promised them emancipation which, you know, what yeah. does a slave want? He wants to be emancipated. <laughs> yeah, Who the hell yeah. wants to be a slave? Right. He just right. wants to be free, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very true. Well, what, Gino, what did yeah. the, what were the Brits gonna do with uh, that many slaves? Did they put them in units or they integrate them or did they well, put them? <laughs> he, they had 300. Dunmore, who was the uh, governor of Virginia, recruited the Ethiopian regiment, but it was about 300 people. Although, included one of George Washington's slaves, one of Patrick Henry's slaves, and one of, I don't remember his first name, Randolph, who was the Speaker of the House at the General Assembly. <laughs> and they had some prominent slaves. But Clinton, General Clinton, also was recruiting slaves. They actually, to be honest, they were a little reluctant to put all of them under arms. Mm -hmm. because <laughs> the loyalists, yeah. the few, I mean, not few, I mean, roughly it was a third, third loyalists, a thir third revolutionaries, and the third, I don't give a damn, just leave me alone. <laughs> but the loyalists did not like the idea of having blacks under arms. So they tended to use them as both sides did during the Civil War, mainly as labor troops, mm -hmm. which is, you know, critical, engineers, fortifications. Mm -hmm. Strong points, whatever. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, those are just numbers that uh, I didn't realize the Brits in the Revolutionary War had taken thousands into their force structure. And after the war, after they lost, which by the way. Where did these thousands come from? Oh, uh, were they slaves? Up and down. Were they slaves that, that ran off the uh, plantations and uh, joined the British uh -huh. Army? A lot of when they they uh, Dunmore in Virginia, he offered them freedom. So once they could get away, they ran for, for uh, the British, just, just like the Civil War. Yeah, and and but then a lot of them died from uh, disease, and because they they were not being because when in Virginia, when then they had to leave for uh, from Great Bridge after the Battle of Great Bridge, they were out on ships. They would have to come into the land to go on hunting parties to try to find food and stuff like that. And that, that you know, I know about uh, here in Virginia, they were done for then. Well, after the seven years that the Civil War, I mean, yeah, the Revolutionary War lasted, which by the way, we just outlasted the British. They got tired because mm -hmm. Washington lost more often than he won. We don't the, French, say the, French. Yeah, the French, the French came in and they kind of changed things. Anyway, after the peace treaty, a lot of the former slaves that had run away, supported the British, 
many of them went to Halifax and a lot of others went to Ontario, but some went to Haiti, other places. I mean, even a few went to Great Britain, not many, but. Hmm. Okay, Haiti. let's get back to, uh, to your War. presentation today. Are you willing to say, without colored troops, Union would not have won the war? No, because okay, they that's, all I, that's all I want to know about your presentation. Thank you. I, I understand they the were rest decisive. Of it. it would have lasted potentially two more years, and it's not guaranteed that the North would have won. No, it's not guaranteed. Frankly, it's not guaranteed no. that the North that the North would have kept on fighting. Not guaranteed exactly. that Abraham Lincoln would have been reelected. Yeah. McClellan so, might have been the next president instead of Andy Jackson, who was a disaster. I won't well, go there. There would have been two different countries, so it wouldn't have been one country. It anyway, it's all interesting. Yeah. I used to think that history was boring. Now I know there's nothing more exciting in the world. Oh, I wouldn't go that far. But history well, is. Well, I would. Is exciting. Huh? I would, old man. Well, <laughs> we're not, that's, we're not. That's, you know, that's, that's an issue anymore. that you, the, you have to deal with. Anyway, uh, no, very interesting. very interesting. Thank you all very much. I hope you spread the word about uh, the book, the conversation. Come to the library. When you come up here, Dennis, come up to look for some property. We'll show you our great library, <laughs> Charles, when you come back. Well, that's great. It's a unique library. It, it was, what's the right word, Barbara? John Hanley, who was a lawyer from Pennsylvania, provided the funds. He did, he provided the funds for the library, the high school. And a high school, and, and, a black, school. and a black school. And school for the poor children, which is where the black kids went in the days of segregation. And that building, they're renovating it now and gonna bring some of that 20th century history alive um, in that in this community. So they're working well, on that. That's interesting, Barbara. Did he initially, did Mr. Hanley initially live in Winchester and then move to Pennsylvania? He did not. He visited here. He was from Scranton, Pennsylvania. There's wow. some speculation that he was sort of a Southern sympathizer and he had no children. So he, he invested money and he also wanted a hotel. So he, no, but he had only visited Winchester. Oh, interesting. It is. It's fascinating. You all must story. have made a great impression on her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's a great city. And Scranton, uh, like, paved parts of the roads and not part and charged him, so he got annoyed with the governing structure in his own community. So it was just the stars were aligned, and we got we we the benefit. But it's a beautiful building and opened in 1913, and uh, wow. has wonderful right. archives full of great research re research opportunities, and so. And here you're putting on Zoom presentation. Now, yeah, we have we have. It's no funny choice. how it evolved. We're zooming around the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. That was very enjoyable. Thank you. Yes, th thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for Charles, joining us. Good meeting you, Gino. I'll see you in February. I'll be checking on those books. Okay. okay. <laughs> thank okay, you. Bye bye. Thank you. Night. Good night.